Good morning, everybody. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Dr. Steve Simons. Uh, when events occur around the organization, in my role as Medical Director for Medical Affairs, I chair these meetings. Uh, we're here today to discuss what is termed a root cause analysis meeting pursuant to regulations by both the Joint Commission as well as the California Department of Public Health. When certain types of adverse events occur in the organization, we are mandated to conduct a meeting involving the people who were present during the case to discuss the case from a systems perspective and attempt to come up with solutions that would prevent similar events from occurring in the future. I want to reassure you this is not a peer review meeting. This is not an employment counseling meeting. If there are issues related to individual performance, those are, those are dealt with elsewhere. I also want to encourage you to make this a team sport. It's best you can call something like this a sport, I guess. But we'd like everybody to be able to feel free to make suggestions, ask questions, so that at the end of the meeting, we have a list of suggested actions that we feel pretty comfortable that if they were put in place, we wouldn't be sitting at this table again with a similar event. Let me remind you all that this meeting is confidential and it's protected. And what that means is um, should an attorney subpoena the minutes of this meeting, they will not be divulged. Um, the only exception would be if someone who's attending this meeting has a hallway conversation and it's overheard, then we cannot, you know, um, assume that information cannot leak out. But I have to tell you that in the 10 years I've been facilitating these meetings, that's never happened. You will see me taking notes and that is simply for the purpose of quality improvement. Again, all the notes, everything is protected. Okay, any questions? The format for the meeting is that Initially, we'll each introduce ourselves and our role, if any, in the case. You don't need to go into a lot of detail because right after that, we will then sequentially, those involved will tell the story. With that, let's introduce ourselves and we'll get started. Uh, I'm Dr. Masala. I was the GYN chief resident on service. Ariel was the intern on service. I'm Dr. Joy. I was the GYN service attending. I'm Dr. Edie. I was the ED attending on for the night of this case. Dr. Mazal, why don't you go over the basic elements of the case with us? Sure. Um, so to review her history, this patient is a 35-year-old G2P1001 at eight and a half weeks by last menstrual period who presented for pregnancy of unknown location. This was an undesired pregnancy. She actually presented to a clinic for termination of pregnancy earlier that day. They were unable to see an intrauterine pregnancy, so they sent her in. She had mild cramping and spotting, but otherwise no significant symptoms. She, her history is otherwise unremarkable, no medical history, no previous surgeries, one uh, previous normal vaginal delivery at term. She takes no medications, uh, and does not smoke, drink alcohol, or do illicit drugs. Her labs were significant for a hemoglobin of 11 and a beta HCG of 3,500. Her ultrasound findings were notable for a mass of a fetal pole measuring 2.5 centimeters and an overall mass measuring 4.5 centimeters. The intern had recommended we consider surgical management, but I thought methotrexate would be appropriate. I discussed it with my attending, who agreed, and so that's what we recommended. So I told Dr. Edie that, and she wrote the order. Um, you point out that you recommended it, but you didn't write the order. Why is that, please? I think I can speak to that. So as the ED attending in the, um, in the emergency room that night, the way that our protocol works is that we want someone who's in-house as an attending to write the order for methotrexate since we consider it a chemotherapeutic agent. So sort of our workflow for someone we suspect might have an ectopic pregnancy is mm -hmm. we consult the GYN team. They come evaluate the patient, make a recommendation that potentially they are a candidate for methotrexate, and then we place the order ourselves as the ED attendings and the pharmacist then verifies it's the correct dose. So that's just how it's been. That's our protocol for having an in-house attending write the order. Uh, 
I see. But my understanding from reviewing the case with you, Dr. Joy, is that in retrospect, you're concerned that this wasn't managed correctly? That's correct. Um, after the patient received methotrexate, she was instructed per our protocol to follow up in my office on days four and seven after the medication. She unfortunately didn't do that, and my staff reached out to her multiple times and was were unable to get her on the phone. She did finally come to the office about a week later and was having worsening pain, so I sent her to the emergency department for another evaluation. At that time, she had another ultrasound that showed free fluid in the pelvis, and she was becoming increasingly uncomfortable on exam, and so we determined that she needed to go to the operating room for a laparoscopy. But we did identify a ruptured ectopic pregnancy and performed a laparoscopic salpingectomy, which was relatively uneventful, and she was discharged home the next day in stable condition. Now, you mentioned you were concerned uh, that even initially there were some issues regarding management? Yes, that's correct. There are some relative contraindications for the use of methotrexate in um, individuals with an ectopic pregnancy. When present, these factors make it more likely for the methotrexate treatment to be unsuccessful, such as when the fetus has uh, cardiac activity or when the beta-HCG pregnancy hormone level is particularly high, greater than about 5,000. Um, additionally, when the ectopic pregnancy, the adnexal mass, measures greater than about three and a half to four centimeters. When the chief resident told me that the crown rump length or the, the length of the fetus itself was two and a half centimeters, in my mind, I interpreted that as the size of the entire mass, and so I thought methotrexate would be appropriate in this otherwise stable patient. Um, so in retrospect, um, realizing that the entire mass was much larger than that, it, it would have been a relative contraindication to methotrexate use. And part of that is on me. I thought that the size of the fetus was what mattered. It, it was my fault, too. Um, I actually looked at the ACOG practice bulletin and felt that the patient needed surgery, but after discussing it with the attending and the uh, chief resident, I felt like I was wrong, so I just ended up not saying anything. Did you feel like you couldn't say anything? No, I didn't feel like I couldn't say anything. It was just that I felt that I was wrong, and I didn't have time to double check, and I'd spoken with the chief resident um, before, so I didn't want to uh, speak up unless I knew for sure that uh, I was right about it, that the patient needed surgery, and I didn't want to bother the attending about it either. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you. I know this is difficult. I want to thank you for being frank and honest. Uh, the next part of the meeting, I would like to solicit thoughts, ideas, suggestions, so that we can put our list together of both what we think could have been done differently here, but more importantly, what we can do in the future if a similar case arises so we feel that we can prevent a similar event from occurring. Thank you.